Hello, yeah, my name is Hyun Ho Shin, and I have the privilege of rounding out this year's talk series with an introduction to MIDI. Um, it's not a very difficult or a technical talk, so relax and try to enjoy. Hopefully it means there aren't too many difficult questions at the end. I don't see Cheng, so I think I'm good. Okay. Uh, many of you have probably heard of MIDI, and maybe even know what it does, and have used it for yourselves. Uh, but wherever you are on the spectrum, hopefully I can tell you something new about what it is, how it works, where it came from, and how it changed the world of music. Now, what is MIDI? Uh, to give you a quick idea of what we can do with MIDI now, uh, here's a quick look at it in action. Of course, it'll take a little more than a presentation to create something like that on the fly, but um, let's see if we can glean some sort of understanding of what's going on. MIDI stands for Musical Instruments Digital Interface. It's a technical standard describing a protocol, digital interface, and connectors that was developed during the first few years of the 1980s. Uh, the chief goal was to try and create a way for a variety of instruments, um, computers, and other devices to communicate with each other. Uh, MIDI, essentially, uh, MIDI essentially describes a bunch of event messages, specifying things like notation, uh, pitch, velocity, and control signals for parameters like volume and vibrato. Uh, these messages are sent via MIDI cables from one device to another, uh, where they can control sound generation and other features that the device offers. Uh, these MIDI devices could be hardware, like a piano keyboard, uh, or software, um, like the popular garage band Logic and Ableton. Um, the possible combinations are endless. Uh, MIDI 1.0 is the full uh, protocol name, and there are two sides to it. The hardware transport specification, uh, describing the electrical and mechanical connection, and the message format specification. Now, the picture we see there, very small in the corner, um, is a MIDI device with a male and female connector. You can actually come up and have a look later if you want to see it in more detail. Now, why is it so significant? Um, the MIDI standard has hardly changed over the years. So you could plug in an instrument designed over 30 years ago into an instrument being designed right now, and it'll probably work just fine. I mean, it's a testament to how robust, simple, and uh, well-received it was and still is. Uh, MIDI is incredibly efficient. We can store an entire song with a few hundred MIDI messages, um, equating to a few kilobytes, uh, compared to actual audio data, which is sampled thousands of times a second. It's also very easy to change things like pitch, duration, and other parameters without having to re-record analog data, uh, meaning editing, post-production, and such as a breeze. And you literally have hundreds of instruments at your disposal. Uh, MIDI only describes the notes you play and how you play it, and you can send these notes to any instrument or any software instrument uh, to play them, allowing free manipulation and exploration of your composition. Uh, the ability for instruments to speak with each other and computers initially spurred the production of sales and uh, production and sales of electronic instruments and music software. Uh, the fact that you could control an instrument with another meant musicians could get by with less hardware, um, and a group of a few members could produce the sound of many more. Um, it's credited for helping revive the music industry in the 80s. It's also introduced a variety of capabilities that transform the way musicians can work. Things like MIDI sequencing, which is simply recording, editing, and playing back music information, uh, made it possible for users with no notation skills uh, to build complex arrangements. Um, it's also helped establish home recording. Um, artists could perform pre-production easily at home with the help of MIDI without professional recording equipment, uh, thus reducing the cost by ar arriving at a studi studio with partially completed work. And finally, uh, MIDI has also triggered the development of various music technology tools for use in musical education. Now, the importance of MIDI in modern music can be seen when we look at the countless number of ways that it's utilized in various aspects of composition, production, and performance. Um, there are many, many different possible applications for the MIDI standard, and I'll briefly talk about just a few of them. 
instrument control. Um, MIDI was originally invented so that instruments could communicate and control each other. Uh, when a note is played on a MIDI instrument, it generates a signal that can trigger a note on another. Uh, this remote control capability meant full-size instruments can be replaced with smaller sound modules and allows musicians to combine instruments to produce a more fuller and more interesting sound. Composition. Uh, as I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, MIDI events can be sequenced with computer software. Uh, because MIDI is a set of commands that create sound, uh, these sequences can be manipulated in ways pre-recorded audio cannot. Uh, this makes composition a much more interactive and involved process, uh, getting immediate feedback and being able to make quick changes in response. We also have standard MIDI files, uh, which is a way for sequences to be saved, transported, and opened in other systems. And we can even hold things like lyrics in the metadata and displayed by karaoke machines, for example. Um, I'll go into some details about the content and format of MIDI files later. And since uh, MIDI is so compact, it's an attractive way to share music as well. MIDI has also found uses in non-musical applications, uh, such as using commands to direct stage lighting and to trigger queued events in things like uh, theater productions. Um, it's also finding uses in kits that allow MIDI control over home lighting and appliances. Um, in general, despite the association with musical instruments, uh, MIDI can control anything that can read and process MIDI commands. General MIDI, as you just saw, or GM for short, is a standard specification for music synthesizers that respond to MIDI messages. Uh, music synthesizers being things that generate electrical signals that are converted to sound. Um, it essentially just imposes several requirements beyond the more abstract 1.0 specs, uh, which in itself provides a communication protocol allowing instruments to interoperate at a fundamental level, uh, but GM extends this by requiring all GM compatible synths uh, to meet a certain minimal set of features, uh, such as being able to play 24 notes simultaneously, called a uh, polyphony. Now we know, the, we know basically what MIDI does. Let's have a look at the history. Um, to really understand the ori origins of MIDI, uh, we need to go all the way back before there were digitally controlled synthesizers, and even before electricity, to the very first desire of controlling musical instruments automatically. Now, the first mechanical musical instruments were documented in the Book of Ingenious Devices, uh, published in 850 AD by three Iranian brothers, collectively known as Banu Musa. Uh, they describe 100 mechanical devices, including two automated musical instruments, um, a hydro-powered organ that played music based on interchangeable cylinders with music patterns on them, and an automatic flute player that actually may have been the first programmable machine. Um, the flute sounds were produced by steam and you could, buy, you could modify settings to create different sounds and patterns. Almost sounded like certain MIDI instruments today, or so I hear. We jump now to the golden age of mechanical music machines, which came in the late 19th and early 20th century with player pianos and orchestrions. Uh, between 1910 and 1930, player pianos were the largest segment of the music industry in the, uh, in the US. A, play, a player piano being any actual acoustic piano that is being played by pneumatic or electromechanical mechanisms uh, that operates the action via pre-programmed music. These pre-programmed music being piano rolls, uh, which is a continuous roll of paper uh, with perforations punched into them uh, that represent note control data. As the holes move over a tracker bar, each musical note is triggered when a perforation crosses the bar. Um, if you look on the right-hand side, it's a little faint, uh, but you can actually see lyrics. Um, so from bottom up, you read those bottom up. So player pianos were actually the first karaoke machines. Um, the piano roll view, the piano roll view of modern MIDI is actually a direct descendant of these 100-year-old um, piano rolls because MIDI does digitally exactly what a player piano did mechanically. Um, here's a quick video of what an example player piano looks like performing Rhapsody in Blue. Kind of creepy, huh? <laughs> now, the relationship between mechanical music and MIDI it uh, gets even more interesting with orchestrions and fairground organs. Um, orchestrions are mechanical machines that have multiple instruments in them and designed to sound like a complete orchestra, hence the name. They're incredibly complex and driven by pneumatic engines. Here's a small example of a classical orchestrion playing maple leaf rag. Uh, see if you can count how many instruments are involved. I 
think I heard at least seven, maybe you agree. Um, and this is a fun animation from Annie Music, a company that develops virtual animated orchestrions. Um, so in this, you could say the balls are the MIDI messages of the setup. Hello. And a few years later, in a perfect example of life imitating art, uh, Intel decided they wanted to take the virtual orchestrium and recreate it in real life um, using processors and sensors. Now this is, uh, this is pretty awesome if I say so myself. <laughs> Yeah, please have a watch of the full videos when you have the time, a mesmerizing way to spend a few minutes, I think. Uh, thankfully, uh, MIDI doesn't require that kind of hardware setup to get the same results today. Next, uh, synthesizers arrived around the 1950s with the RCA synthesizer one and two. Uh, definition of a synthesizer is just an electronic instrument typically operated by a keyboard uh, producing a wide variety of sounds. Uh, these were humongous pieces of engineering, uh, but it wasn't long before these themselves were synthesized down into smaller components thanks to the work of visionaries like Dr. Robert Moog and Harold Bode. Uh, Moog is generally credited, and rightly so, for taking the synthesizer out of university laboratories and putting them into the hands of musicians. Uh, like player pianos, the major attraction of these synthesizers were the ability to control them externally. Not with piano rolls, obviously, but uh, control voltages. Uh, but even though gates and voltages are relatively simple, there were never any real standard. Um, some companies use, used uh, volt per octave, some used hertz per volt, and various other configurations. Uh, the popularity of synthesizers uh, got a major boost in 1978 uh, when microprocessor-based instruments began to appear, uh, led by a new California comp company, Sequential Circuits. Uh, the Profit 5 in the picture offered reasonable levels of um, playability, stability, and polyphony, uh, but costed like $4,000 at the time. Soon, companies like um, Korg, Roland, and Yamaha joined in, uh, decreasing price and putting synthesizers in the hands of every self-respecting keyboard player. And although stability, playability, and polyphony continued evolving in the early 1980s, uh, compatibility still remained a problem. Uh, the multifarious nature of synth design meant each manufacturer had been defining things like pitch and timing data in their own way. Finally, MIDI is born. Uh, visionaries including Dave Smith from Sequential Circuits and Ikutaru Kakehashi from L Roland uh, began to worry that this lack of compatibility between manufacturers would restrict uh, people's use of synth synthesizers, which would ultimately inhibit sales growth. So talk of a universal digital communication system began circulating in 1981. Dave Smith and Chet Wood uh, presented a paper at AES proposing a universal synth interface uh, running at 19.2 kilobaud using regular quarter-inch uh, phone jacks. At the following National Association of Music Merchants show in January uh, 1982, in a meeting between leading American and Japanese synth manufacturers, a certain improvements were made to the specs, like increasing the board rate to 31.25k. Uh, the name MIDI was chosen and publicly announced in 82, and by as early as December of the same year, it appeared on an instrument, the Sequential Prophet 600, uh, with Roland's JP6 following very soon after. And these two were successfully connected at the 83 NAMM show, and a new chapter in the history of electronic music was written. In 1983, uh, the MIDI specs was only about eight pages and defined only the most basic instructions, like how to play notes and how to control volume. Um, although the way MIDI works has not changed since then, the MIDI protocol has grown to encompass many additional concepts. Now, uh, let's get into some of the nitty gritty of MIDI. Each MIDI capable instrument has a transmitter and a receiver. Um, although certain peripheral devices like signal processors may only have one of these. They operate at 31.25 kilovolt, asynchronously and serially. And uh, MIDI supports a maximum of 16 channels. Um, just like TV or, TV or radio channels, um, if MIDI messages are being sent down channel, on channel three, only those listening on channel three will receive those messages. MIDI cables 
uh, connect instruments with the in, out, and through jacks. In port receiving incoming messages, out port transmitting the actions of the keyboard to other keyboards or a computer. And the through jack provides a direct copy of the data coming into the MIDI in jack, uh, giving us the ability to daisy chain several instruments and devices together. Uh, so any action on an instrument that corresponds to a particular MIDI code will normally transmit through the MIDI out, but not MIDI through. So through is a copy of the input. Uh, but many recent instruments have a switch where you can change the MIDI through port to be a MIDI out port instead. Uh, that's a simple uh, MIDI network in the picture. Uh, the MIDI interface you see there um, is used to match clock speeds between MIDI devices and the computer. Now, every MIDI message is a status byte that begins with a one followed by one or two data bytes that begins with a zero. Uh, so we have seven bits per byte to represent the message. Each byte implicitly has a start and stop bit, but they're not important, so we won't worry about those. Each status byte has three bits to denote the type of message, followed by four bits to denote the channel number to which the message applies, hence the 16 channels. Uh, together with the data bytes, the whole MIDI message falls under the five following formats. Channel voice, uh, for controlling the instrument's voices, playing notes, sending controller data, and so on. Channel mode, which defines an instrument's response to voice messages. System common, which are messages intended to all networked instruments and devices. System real time, again intended for all um, network devices, but that contains only status bytes and is used for synchronization of all devices. And system exclusive, which were originally used for manufacturer specific codes, but has, has been expanded to include various other things. Now, channel voice messages are the most com common type of MIDI message. Uh, they convey information about whether to turn a note on or off, what patch to change to, how much key pressure to exert, and various other things as outlined in the table. Uh, the status byte is composed of the message specifying the hex value, uh, followed by the channel number. So a note off message, for example, for channel seven would be eight, six, uh, six because um, channel one to 16 is actually zero to 15, as expected. Uh, one interesting thing of note is that while almost all channel voice messages assign a single data byte uh, to a single parameter like note number or velocity, uh, the exception is pitch bend at the bottom there. Um, if pitch bend only used 128 values, uh, discrete steps might be heard if the bend range were large, since this range is set on an instrument, not by MIDI. So the seven non-zero bits of the first data byte is actually combined with the seven non-zero bits of the second data byte to create a 14-bit data value, uh, giving a much larger range of 16,384 uh, with which to bend the pitch. Now, of the channel voice messages, the note on and note off message makes up the bulk of the information, since most of what you do is either play or stop playing the note. There are 128 possible note values, 0, 2, 1, 1 2, 7, and this is around 10 octaves. Um, they are mapped to the chromatic Western music scale, uh, with middle C commonly mapped to number 60. Uh, that little bit of text at the bottom is middle C. Uh, just for reference, a typical full-size piano has 88 keys. The second data byte of the note on note off is holding the velocity value and characterizes how hard the key was hit. A note on velocity can be used to control volume and timbre of a sound. A note on with velocity zero is actually the same as note off. On the graph here, the note on velocity will directly affect the attack phase. Now, putting all this together, an example message for playing middle C on channel five very loudly with maximum velocity will look like so. So the first four bits is nine, indicating that it's note on. The next four indicates that it's channel five. The first data byte tells us to play note 60, which is middle C and the second data byte plays with, uh, tells us to play with maximum velocity. Now, uh, simultaneous events in MIDI have to be sent as a string of serial commands. A three note chord or triad, for example, will be transmitted as three separate note velocity pairs. Uh, because of the transmission speed, this is normally perceived as a simultaneity, uh, but as polyphonic instruments have increased the number of voices, uh, the speed of both the interfaces, uh, pr interfaces processes, and sheer volume of serial data makes large simultaneous events susceptible to glitches, undesired arpeggiations, and data errors. Uh, to make more use, uh, to make more efficient use of the limited bandwidth, uh, manufacturers adopted a shortcut called running status. 
It allows a single status bytes action to remain in effect for an unlimited number of data byte pairs which follow. Uh, for example, to play three simultaneous notes on the same MIDI channel, a note on status byte can be sent followed by six data bytes as shown. So this is a note on playing on channel one with three of these pairs. And to further help minimize data, the note on status can be used with velocity zero instead of a note off status. So the above message could be followed by these three sequences of data bytes to turn the three notes off. Vel zero indicating that the velocity is zero. Now controllers are where the real expressive power of MIDI comes to play. Um, they're invoked by controller change status, B followed by the channel number, uh, followed by the controller number and controller value. Uh, there is a huge list of controllers, but uh, these four here are the most important, uh, mod wheel, uh, volume controller, pan, and sustain. Um, in general, uh, controller numbers zero to 63 are reserved for continuous style data, uh, like volume, modulation, wheel, etc. cetera. And 64 to 121 have been reserved for switch on and off controllers like a sustain pedal, uh, with convention of off being um, zero to 63 in the controller value and the rest being on. And uh, while MIDI specs suggest these default uses, and most manufacturers set the defaults for at least these four above, um, the actual responses of an, an instrument is determined by its programming, uh, which can often be altered. Like the sustain pedal could be programmed to jump an octave, for example. Um, and a little extra detail is that controllers uh, 32 to 63 of the continuous style data are actually reserved as an additional seven bits of the least significant bits for the corresponding controllers zero to 31. So controller 39, for example, could be used to fine tune controller seven or main volume. In the same way pitch bend was um, extended before. Controllers 122 to 127 is up next and it stands for channel mode messages. Uh, channel mode messages are a special case of control change message with the same status byte BN. Uh, but they are intended to control the overall function of all voice channels on an instrument. Uh, the MIDI 1.0 specs intends that instruments be designed to operate under only one mode at a time, uh, which means if you change the mode, uh, all notes should turn off automatically. The four types of modes are Omni, Monopoly, all notes off, and local control. If Omni is set on, it's instructing all instrument uh, voices to respond to all received channel voice messages. Um, so it's like your TV displaying all channels simultaneously. And if, if Omni is off, you're receiving from the appropriate channel. Mono means use the instrument in a monophonic way, uh, which is simply that it plays one note at a time and no more. So a new note on message in, in mono mode um, ends the previous note and begins the new note. Uh, this may be useful when using synth with patch uh, with portamento, uh, gliding between notes, so that mono means um, the glide is not muddy with overlapping sounds. And poly just means uh, play multiple notes at the same time. All notes off does exactly what it says and is useful for sequencing programs where missed messages may leave notes hanging or sounding indefinitely because it missed its note off command. Uh, local control separates the keyboard function of a synthesizer from its sound producing capability. Uh, useful when you only want notes from um, returning from a computer to cause the instruments to sound, for example. Uh, avoiding the common problem of doubled notes. Finally, just another type of change is program change message with status CN, uh, which is used to specify the type of patch, preset, or voice that should be used uh, to play the sounds on a given channel. Uh, following on from channel messages, we have three different types of system messages. I'm sure you're getting bored of these details, so let me give you a quick summary of these. So what system messages um, are and distinguishes them from the channel messages is the fact that they don't include channel numbers. Uh, they're intended to address all devices in the system. The three we have are system common, system real time, and system exclusive messages. System exclusive expand the functionality of MIDI in limitless ways. So they can be used to send stuff like patch parameters or sample data between devices, and manufacturers or equipment of equipment may define their own formats for system exclusive data. Um, the standard only defines how messages begin and how they end. Um, so each manufacturer is given a unique ID, and in the message, um, this ID is followed by any number of data bytes um, and terminated with the end of exclusive message. Uh, this ability to send large chunks of data 
and define your own message formats. Mentit found uses in things like patch dumping and loading, allowing patches to be transferred to a sequencer or a computer for storage and reload. And the, for those of you wondering what a patch is, it's just a sound setting for a synthesizer. Now, system common messages include things like song select, tune request, and song position pointer. Um, they just determine, they, they do exactly what they say in determining playback of a MIDI sequence. And they usually deal with an instrument's onboard sequencer or drum machines that might have pre-recorded MIDI sequences. Finally, uh, system real-time messages are used for synchronization of all the MIDI clock-based equipment, uh, particularly in sequences. Uh, the job of the sequencer is to initiate musical events, and if it doesn't do that exactly when we want, then it's pretty much useless. Uh, the problem is that these sequences have a specified clock rate and can't render an event at an arbitrary time like us as humans can. So what timing clock messages are is a simple status byte F8 that is sent six times per MIDI beat. One MIDI beat is a 16th note. So we get 24 of these messages per crotchet. Now, a crotchet or quarter note is a single beat. So in a common four by four time signature, you have one, two, three, four. It's these single beats. Uh, these messages are given priority over all other messages, meaning they can appear anywhere in the data stream where bytes can be separated out. So even in between like a note on message with a status and data byte, you could stick it in between a status and a data byte. These timing messages represent musical tempo rather than, than real time, because we are dealing with musical beats, not physical time. And there's been a real need to develop a way to synchronize MIDI with film and video. Um, and this required absolute timing. Uh, the film industry had its own form of time code called SMTPE. Now, and shortly after the adoption of MIDI 1.0, a new class of code called MIDI timecode was proposed to act as a bridge between the two. Um, external devices would convert MIDI timecode to SMTPE and vice versa. Uh, the start, stop, and continue uh, just controls the playback of a sequence. Active sending signal is used to help eliminate stuck notes which can occur if a MIDI cable is dis disconnected during playback of a sequence. Um, without active sending, if the cable was disconnected during playback, then some notes may be left playing indefinitely. And uh, just to stray off topic slightly and talk about reliability issues quickly, um, the original MIDI specification calls for a maximum cable length of just 50 feet or 50 meters, which is just a bit larger than the width of the stage. Now, this can obviously be a problem in performance settings in large stage arenas. Um, with conventional MIDI cables any longer and we could cause corruption of MIDI data or intermittent signals resulting in notes not triggering, sequences not starting, channels not switching, or missed or wrong notes being played, which would all be a disaster in a performance setting. Um, there are various extender products and specialized cables out there allowing up to 1,000 feet and also a fiber optic system that can extend the signals up to a mile or more uh, with essentially no interference or loss or corruption of data. And uh, even the reliability of MIDI signals it is intrinsically linked to the cable. Uh, cables are not much, that much of a factor in latency. Um, the biggest cause of problems with latency, especially back in the old days, is actually the performance of your CPU as to how quickly it can process these messages. And also generally what you have in your setup and how you're using it. Uh, yeah, this was uh, particularly a problem in earlier microprocessor-based um, instruments with absolutely rubbish CPUs. So that's the biggest culprit. And then there could be problems due to monitoring through software processes, which delays output. Um, your driver could be old and bad, or you could just have the wrong buffer settings. Now, we've covered how messages are formatted. Uh, let's talk about how they can be saved and transported externally. Standard MIDI files were created in 1988 due to an explosion of different types of MIDI software. So we needed a way to save, transport, and open MIDI sequences. You can save a standard MIDI file created by some notation program and open it in a MIDI sequencing program, which will understand various parameters of the file like track names, time signatures, tempo change, and so on. There are three main types of standard MIDI files. Type zero, which is a file consisting of just one track. Type one, where sequences can be saved as separate tracks that are in synchrony, so they all have to be played at the same time. And type two, um, where we can have multiple asynchronous tracks. Uh, this is rarely used, but we can um, store multiple arrangements where each track can have its own tempo. Uh, MIDI files also stores metadata with uh, things like track names, uh, tempo change, key signatures, and lyrics. Now, data in an SMF is organized into either header or track chunks 
called MTHD and MTRK, respectively. Uh, we have four bytes of ASCII indi indicating what type of chunk it is, followed by four bytes indicating the length of data, which is then followed by the actual data. A header chunk starts every file. It's 14 bytes, and the length of the data component is always six. Uh, the first two bytes of data define format, zero, one, or two. The second two bytes, NTRKS, uh, defines the number of tracks the chunks contain. And division, finally, uh, defines the timing format. And just to explain timing stuff quickly, uh, because SMFs are intended to be as universal as possible, uh, they don't only contain note information, but also include the number of MIDI clocks that need to elapse between note events. Uh, the amount of time these actually take being relative to tempo indication. Uh, so what we have are MIDI events that are preceded by a delta time value, and this represents the number of ticks from the previous event that must pass before the current event occurs. And division data of the header chunk essentially just describes the format of this delta time. Track chunks contain strings of MIDI events, each labeled with a preceding delta time, as I explained. And these are represented as a variable length quantity, uh, which is where we have a series of bytes, uh, but the most significant bit is reserved to indicate whether another byte follows or not. So each byte only holds seven bits of actual data, but we can store arbitrarily large values. So to convert a binary number to a variable length quantity, uh, we simply split the, split the binary representation into groups of seven, and stick a one at the front if there's more to come, or zero if it's the last byte. If the file format is zero, we'll have one track chunk. Format one means one or more tracks that are played simultaneously. Format two means one or more tracks played independently. Finally, an event can be channel messages, system exclusive messages, or meta event messages. Uh, with channel messages, uh, the running status is ap applicable within MIDI files just as it is um, as I described before. And this status is canceled by any system exclusive or meta event. A uh, meta event has things like track name, copyright, and instrument name. Uh, they don't read, result in MIDI messages being sent, but are still useful bits of info. And uh, just because users can share standard MIDI files does not guarantee those files will be played back with the same sort of sounds they were created with, um, either by instruments or computers. Um, general MIDI or GM specifications that I mentioned before helps compatibility by setting standards they must, that must be met. Now that was a lot of details, so perhaps a quick practical demonstration of some of the things I talked about. Uh, this is Logic Pro, a popular sequencing program for the Mac, and we see a single track project with a piano, a piano roll that will display the, exactly the notes I play and when, and also a visualizer for the pedal. Um, I've had to decrease this in size due to limited pixels. Um, so keep an eye, on out, uh, an eye out on these as I play. Uh, maybe I'll play, a, excuse this side of my head, I don't have this on my screen. Okay, there it is. Maybe I'll play a section of the Maple Leaf Rag that was played by the classical orchestrian before. See if it's getting it. All right, it's coming through. Hit that quickly and hit. Okay. Record. Let's have a look at what we have. Thank you. I was playing around with this before, and it looks like it recorded in the middle of the track. Let's bring it back to the beginning and unmute this. Now, if we have a quick playback. We can hear exactly what I played. And each of these bars we see here is a note on and note off pair. The the uh, leading edge indicating a note on, and the ending edge indicating a note off. If we double click on one of these that look interesting, uh, it's a big one. Right, if we double click on this, what is going We should be able to get a little more information. What are you doing? 
Oh, there it is. Right. If we have a look, we see that it's a C4. This is an octave above middle C, which is C3, with a velocity of 81. We can easily change these values, so we could play it really quietly with a velocity 15. Uh, we'll change it to be really loud, 125. As you can see, if you notice, the, uh, the color of the bars changed as I changed the velocity. Uh, this big number on the left represents position. So the value here is less than the value here. And this represents length. So this is a lot smaller than that, for example. So the length would just be calculated by finding the difference in position between the note on and note off. And if we quick, quickly have a look for our good friend middle C here, this, one, this message would, exactly, would be exactly as we saw before, a note number of 60 and a velocity of 93. And I'm pretty sure this is the default channel that it's running on, so I'm pretty sure it's channel one or channel zero. Now, uh, let's, and I'm not sure if you, if you noticed, but I played something weird and wrong at the end. <laughs> let's have a look at the end there. They're just the completely the wrong chord. They're a whole tone, whole tone off. Uh, so what we can do is just, just drag it down to where we want it to be. Just changing the note number and correcting our mistakes. Let's have another listen. Sounds a lot better. But there's still something missing. I want this top A flat to be played with this final chord. So what I can do is just draw it in. I think that's it. And line it up correctly. With the chord, looks about right, and it sounds a lot better. Now let's say I'm getting bored of the piano um, and want, the, want to run these messages through a different instrument, then all I have to do uh, is just search what the library offers. Let's say I want to hear it through some marimba, uh, which should be under, please cooperate. There we go, found it. So if we go back and play with this instrument, we get a completely different sound. Now I could stand here all day and just uh, create the whole orchestrion we saw before, but I'll leave some of the evening to your own time and quickly explore some other concepts. What I can do is get this uh, track and explore, export it as a SMF file. Export, there we go. I'll save it in our demo folder, uh, call it Maple. Because the song was called Maple Leaf Rag, if you're wondering. And if we have a quick look at the file here. It's an old laptop, it's like 2011. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Go on. And this is meant to be a lightweight text editor as well. It's meant to be quick. How about? All right. <laughs> this has come out. I'll try once more. Wait. Okay. So, this is the file, I think. Uh, nope, that's a... <sighs> Looks like um, it just doesn't like that file, so I'll just use the file I've been playing around before, because it's essentially the same. So if we look, we can see that it starts off. <laughs> All right, okay, so if we look, we can see it starts off with an MTHD, a header, tr a header chunk, as we expect, with a format of zero, all right, those four, the, those four x values, followed by a length of six, which is what we expect as well for a header. We can see it has one track, and it's followed by an MTRK or one track chunk. Um, I won't go into these, all these event messages, but it seems the track chunk has some 
uh, meta event that we're uh, meta events that we can read and recognize. So that's all good. All right, go away. And what we can actually do is um, save this standard MIDI file into a USB and have it played by the keyboard, kind of reminiscent of the player piano with the piano rolls, right? So let's see if that will cooperate. There we go. And while this is scanning and checking there aren't any viruses on it, let's have a quick look at another cool feature of Logic, which is where you can see the score of the music you're playing. Now, it looks a complete mess because I didn't keep to the tempo and obviously went a little berserk on the pedal, but um, yeah, we, can visualize we can see as a musical score exactly what we played and click on one of these and drag it around. There we go. Exactly what we did with the minutes. That sounds, sounded softly different. Um, you, you have to take my word for it. And if we just load up the file on the keyboard, now the, now the keys aren't moving about as the player piano did, but it's, exact, it's doing exactly uh, what we saw. All right, that was a lot more stressful than I anticipated. Okay, so let's just talk about the future of MIDI and just and summarize. Since 2005, there's been talk of a high definition protocol um, offering full backwards compatibility with 1.0 and allowing support for higher transport um, uh, higher, higher speed transports, so that plug and play devices are better supported. Uh, the number of channels and controllers are to be increased, and simpler messages are to be implemented as well. And finally, entire new kinds of events are being supported uh, with various things aimed at specific controllers like um, guitars. Uh, as of 2010, the HD protocol was um, nearing its completion, but it's still uncertain whether it will be picked up by industry. And uh, not specifically about the future of MIDI, but some of the things I haven't talked about in the current way uh, MIDI is being used include things like uh, wireless MIDI, uh, where MIDI signals are transmitted over Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Uh, this is being used widely in like mobile iOS and Android music composition. And uh, I mostly talked about keyboard synthesizers and controllers, uh, but there are various other MIDI controllers like wind instruments that allow MIDI parts to be played with the kind of expression and articulation that is available to players of wind and brass. Uh, they allow breathing and pitch, uh, pitch glide control for more versatile kind of phrasing uh, with things like breathing uh, with, uh, with sensors that convert breath pressure to volume and convert lip pressure to pitch bend and so on. Also, things like drum controllers that are much more practical than keyboard drum playing when doing things like drum roll, so you're not going to doing this on the keyboard, or just uh, allowing drummers to play more naturally. Uh, even guitars um, can be fit with special pickups that can digitize the instrument's output and allow it to play a synthesizer's sound. Okay, to summarize, uh, there are so many ways that MIDI is being utilized and developing the world of music. Um, if we look back, MIDI was created uh, during a period where conflict was everything. Um, Mac versus Windows, uh, VHS versus Betamax, Ford versus GM. Uh, but the fact that these musical industry leaders uh, put their differences aside, pulled their ideas and resources together to create a way to collaborate and evolve music to where it is today, I think is simply amazing. Uh, Craig Anderton said that he always saw division between players and composers, but MIDI helped break that down. And uh, I really couldn't agree more uh, with MIDI Composers could explore their compositions freely with the instruments at their command, forgoing the process of finding, trying to find musicians to play their masterpieces. And uh, players were given the ability to get down their ideas and handed the power to explore that aspect of music um, in an easier way. I think the way MIDI granted us access to a broader spectrum of what music could be um, and uh, gave us a better understanding of how we can interact with it is what really defines how significant it is. And the things people are able to do with it today speaks volumes uh, as to how grateful we should be that visionaries 30 years ago assembled to try and get their instruments to chat with each other. Thanks for listening, and good luck with the rest of the year. <laughs>